It's a good pleasure to be here, and especially it's my honor to have the opportunity to present my uh, research in this conference. Um, so some friends here have seen this talk before, so I hope you still enjoy this time. And uh, some other new friends are still having jet lag, so I hope uh, I'll try now to make this. I'll try to make this not too complicated, and I'll try to keep the talk simple. So I'll spend most of the time talking about our models and playing our results. And uh, in the last maybe 10, 15 minutes, I'll talk about some uh, ideas on the proofs, some technical issues. So my adventure on the self-similarity started with uh, some a very simple fact that everybody knows so well in this room. So, so let's take, uh, if we have, if I have an ID in the variables, and if I sum them, then I got a simple random walk, and I look at the simple random walk as n, I look at the time as n of t, and in the ID case, we know so well that this guy we normalize by square root of n if, say, the xi's are 0, mean, and the finite variance. And then, as a process, we converge, we have converted to a process, which is the famous uh, uh, running motion, and uh, with some uh, constant disparities. And that's that everybody knows this so well. And that's in the ID case, and of course we can go beyond that. And uh, well, the first step, one thing you can do is, okay, what about we still have stationarity, but we have some kind of a weak dependence. That's the first thing you can think of. That's the kind of natural thing you think of. And if the dependence is kind of a weak, and eventually we still expect the running motion to show up in the limit. Okay, that's, so the weak dependent is basically you can do, you can just do, use techniques to, to, to change the problem back to the ID case, or turn your array. And then if the dependence is not that weak, in the sense that we have kind of a um, strong dependence or long range dependence, whatever you call it, then eventually you do not, we do not normalize the partial sum by one half. But instead, sometimes, in some cases, we know that given a stationary sequence of random variables, and uh, if we normalize it properly to the power n to power h, and eventually we can see uh, the correction of running motion showing up. And that's kind of my starting point for the uh, the self-similarities, and this is the one way to, to, to understand uh, the fraction of running motion in the limit. And uh, you, can, you can ask, okay, what are the general assumptions for these station random variables to have this kind of convergence or inverse principles? Or you can ask, what are the specific models that will give me this kind of weak convergence? Okay, so in this talk, I'm taking the second point of view. I'm going to start with the concrete model uh, of this uh, random variable stationary which is proposed by uh, Hammond and Sheffield in uh, two years ago. And uh, that, well, I think we all see models that lead to the inverse principles for fractional body motion, but this model by Hammond and Sheffield is quite new and still, at least at the first time, is quite different from all the other models that we know. Okay, so I'll explain this model in the first maybe 10, 15 minutes of this talk, and then I'll go from there to see what is our kind of interest, our contribution on the generalization of this uh, result by uh, Hammond Sheffield. So this is a very recent paper, so maybe not all of us are familiar with this. So let me just start talking about this, this, this model. So basically, this model has two steps. The first step is, OK, we want to construct a random graph. which is a graph indexed by z, okay? And then, call this graph g of mu. I'll explain what is mu in a moment. And then, conditionally on mu, we want to sample my xi. Conditionally on this graph structure. So basically, the random graph structure will determine the dependent structure of my random variable, xi. And this xi eventually will show up here in this partial sum. And then we have weak convergence to fraction of running motion. Okay, so let's see what is modeled by proposed by uh, these two uh, these two guys. So let's I uh, first draw uh, some uh, some vertices of the from C. So let's say this is zero. Uh, I think I need a little bit more space. So what I do is okay. I put on this. 
uh, vertices, I'm going to draw one single random edge from every single vertex to the left. Say from zero, I draw one guy, go to minus one, and I call this guy, this is my random edge and jump, I call this J of zero. Okay? And then the same thing for every vertex. So every from every guy, I may have I may have only one edge to the left, but I may have multiple edges uh, from the right. So for example, we can have also from one to about minus one, and from two we go to say minus three, and uh, and then maybe from minus one we go to minus four, and uh, from three we also go to um, let's see what do I want this picture here. From three we also go to minus three, and from two we go to somewhere else, and uh, somewhere goes to two. Okay, and so on. We may have some edges from the from the right of these pictures. So this is completely messy, but the one remark is okay, since every vertex I mean, so when some vertices are connected by the edges, we can ask okay, which vertices are in the same group or in the same component of this graph. Okay? And uh, let's mark them by color. So let's see here in this case I think it's one, zero, minus one, and then minus four, they are one group. And uh, two, from two I go to minus three, and from three I go to minus three. So these two, three, and the minus three, we form another group. And this minus two guy is isolated here, and he himself forms its own group. So of course I'm cheating a little bit because they may say this red guy and then this red and yellow guy, they may intersect in the somewhere to the left, but by doing this, I'm saying, okay, they are not meeting anywhere to the left. Okay, it's clear that once we observe this window, if they are not meeting here, they are not, they are, they are not coming, coming from the same component from the right. Okay, and so basically then, that's kind of our random graph structure. And uh, take a careful look, for every component, actually, locally, we have a tree. The red guy is a tree, so this is one of the vertices of the tree. It has one sister and has several, has two children. Okay, so actually our random graph here is actually is a random forest. The G is this kind of a, the, the forest structure we have. Okay, so that is the first step to construct this model. We first construct random graph model indexed by Z, which is a random forest. And then the question you may ask is, okay, wait a minute, what is, uh, how do you guarantee that, okay, this component you may have, even in many components, or not, just the one single component, and everyone will meet each other. And that depends on my, how do I define this, this kind of law that I have here. Uh, so this J, J, J0 is jump from 0 to the left, and J1 is jump from 1 to the left. So in general, what we have is, the jumps are random variables, their law are ID. So every every vertex I give a I take an ID in the variable. It's the length of the edge going to the left. We have some law mu, and the mu has support. Uh, let me draw. Let me draw here. So mu has support uh, is subset of n. Okay. So they only jump to the left. They do not stay. And the law of this, uh, the law of mu is a power law, and make my life easier, I just say this decays as n power uh, subtractor alpha. And the one of the result we know is, well, in that result by um, and Sheffield is, if alpha uh, between zero and one half, and that's the range that we care about here. In this case, for this random graph, we have a piece of probability one. This random graph, this random forest, has infinitely many components. Okay, so that's some properties of this this random graph structure. So we are 
diagram is our first step. We have this random graph. We know some properties. The way one of the very important properties is about okay, how many components I have. So once I know I have these many many um, components, the next step is. Uh, that's why I want to keep this part. The next step is I want to give a law, give uh, generate random variable to xi from the structure of this random graph. So what I do is the following. So. So this is how. Well, yes, that's follow, that's follow from this choice of the measure. You can think of you can think of that's the alpha depends on what is the chance of you have very 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 big jump. If all your jumps are very very small, say single random walk, then every two sides are in the same component because you just jump and you meet another and you merge. The only chance that you do not meet the other guy is you, you you both of you jump 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 and then one of you have a huge jump and then never you never catch up each other again. So that's kind of the intuition when yeah, you want to choose your alpha in this brain, kind of power law depending on your jumps. Yeah. Is that for you? Uh, it's actually, it's uh, if only if. If only it's, uh, you have a complete uh, characterization on uh, you how many components you have. It's either one component or infinitely many components. So let me take some space here. So now I move on to the, general, uh, to the uh, law of the random variables xi. Remember, my goal is to obtain the sequence of random variables stationary, and I want to look at the, the behavior of the partial sum. So what do I do with this law? Okay, so there are so given this random graph g. So what we do is if so if i and j are in the same component, I use this tilde to say okay, if they if they are in the same component. So what I say is, okay, I want xi and xj to take the same value. Okay, so <coughs> say here, that means I want to find x minus 1, x0, and x1, and x minus 4, they take the same value. And uh, if we are not in the same component, I want these two to be independent. So like the value of x minus 3 and uh, x, uh, x minus 1, Given this graph, their values are conditionally independent. And the last one is, what is the marginal value of this graph, all of the all different variables? And then the marginally, I want my xi. Each xi has the law is uh, Bernoulli uh, one half. OK, so that is, what I do is, OK, for this graph, say, if I want to sampling this sequence of xi's, what I do is, I flip a coin for the red part, say I got the one, then I put uh, one for all the different variables with indices colored by red. And then I flip another coin for the random variables indexed by the yellow part, say this time it's like on minus one. And the last time I do another one for the, for the blue guy, I make out minus one again, and that's how I assign the value of x i. Okay. I do this process, I go to my model, and then the re their result is, okay, they have the uh, inverse principle in this form. And uh, h equal to 1 half plus alpha, uh, which is in the range of uh, 1 half and 1. So they have a model for uh, inverse principle uh, to the fraction of quantum motion in the, in the region of uh, long range dependence. Okay? So actually they have a... They not only have a weak inverse principle, they have a strong inverse principle, but that's not our uh, focus point. And uh, so when uh, the first time I, I saw this model, I feel like, okay, this is uh, quite different from the other models that I know when you, that leads you to a uh, uh, fraction of one motion. And then naturally there are some uh, open questions um, uh, need to be uh, done about this model. And also the authors mentioned several open questions. And here we're going to address uh, one of the open questions, that is, uh, what we do for this model if we care about uh, kind of similar flavor structures in the high dimension. So that's kind of our motivation. And uh, so now I'll introduce uh, uh, our model. I think I want to move this. Is the assumption of Bernoulli very simple? Uh, that's the point. Here I think we know how to do for the uh, under this, for the fourth moment, we know what to do. And I don't know if I can do to the two plus a moment, I don't know. But for fourth moment, we can do. Yeah. Well, infinite variance, you expect to get uh, something like a fractional Say it again? If you have infinite variance, 
Oh, that's a question. Uh, we don't know. I think that's uh, that's a very good question. We we tried a little bit, and uh, uh, we can talk more on this. Yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting question. So that is in dimension one, and here I'm going to talk about what happens in dimension larger than one, and this is a joint work with uh, uh, F and F and and I'll give it you and myself. So uh, F and will be here, should be here already, but she got this one of the problem with the flight, and uh, Olivia is here. And um, so this uh, uh, is a very reasonable work. This work just uh, we just finished this uh, kind of uh, two months ago. So the first thing is I'm going to talk about uh, uh, what is the what we think of a model for this guy in the high dimension the plane. So of course I want to consider say D two in this talk. I want to consider that is that uh, the lattice of D two. And of course, I want to talk about think of okay, how to produce or generate a random graph in, in Z2 or ZD. So what we do is the following. Um, I start, uh, again, I do the same thing from every vertex. I want to draw uh, a random edge and to another vertex. Um, let's try to have some more light. Uh, I think he couldn't figure out how to get uh, these four out. Um, oh, do you want me to write larger or? Okay. Uh, just feel free to stop me if there's any any question about uh, about any part of the talk. So what we want to do is okay. We want to draw an edge to to find uh, you know the in the one dimension is the ancestor of the graph. And here, the first question is, OK, if I want to draw an edge, I have all the directions for me to choose. And uh, do we want to fix direction or not? OK, and that's the first question. And our setup is, OK, I want this guy. I want to draw a random edge. It always goes to the left and to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the south part. OK, it always goes to uh, this direction. And maybe the first edge, something like this. And the second edge goes to here. And another one goes down here. Okay, it never goes to the other directions. It always goes to the left, uh, down direction. And of course, there are other uh, edges. Okay, it's that's one component. So let me try to do another one to give you an idea of what we look at. It's one node, and this one goes to here, and this one we go to. And another one. Okay, and we can put a blue one there as well. So I'm, I'll, I'm I only do a two here. So, so the first constraint is okay. I still want my jumps to be ID. Okay, the jump are the side or actually direction is to the left to the right. So. And I still want this to have an ID measure mu, and then I want my support of measure mu to be included in the uh, in two. Okay, I don't want them to, to jump back. They always go to the go to one direction. Okay, kind of a, that's the first assumption. The second assumption is okay, clearly I have some regularly bearing assumption there. I need to kind of a generalized version for that for our uh, uh, spatial model, and then what we pick is, uh, well, we have a general version, but here for this talk, I'm going to focus on this uh, simple uh, simple model. So mu equals to mu1, um, for that of mu2. So mu1 and mu2 are both are measured on, on n, and both like what we have in the, in the previous model. Okay, it's mu i. Is the case in the power law and power minus alpha. Okay. 
So one way to see is okay, how do I find the jump for the for the edge from any vertex? Well, I first jump one direction, taking one of the measure mu as in, as in dimension one, and independently I take another direction to the other direction, and then I take the vector for that for my jump. Okay, so that is uh, so that is our model for the first part, the first part of the, for the graph part, and based on that, so that's the p part, the random graph part, and based on that, I can sample my random variables, even this random graph mu exactly in the same manner as we did in one dimension. Okay, I first uh, sample this uh, uh, random forest, and then I need to, for different, for every single component, I flip a coin, I assign the same value there. And for different components, I do independently. And then the question is, okay, I, we should have some results on the number of components here uh, for this model. So what we know here is, what we can show is, uh, always here, so what we can show in this case is if 1 over alpha 1 plus 1 over alpha b larger than 2, you can do b equals 1, you can do b equals 2 can do for any b. So actually this is kind of a generalization of the one dimensional result. If the sum of 1 over alpha i is larger than 2, and that is the case, uh, we have uh, infinitely many components. Okay. And if the sum is less than two, uh, that one we have uh, we have only one component. Here, actually, we know what happens at the boundary case. At the boundary case, it depends on whether you have a regularly varying component there. It's kind of a integration integration test. So actually, we know what happens in the boundary case, but that's that's not very important here. Um, so, so clearly we work on this we, we work on this regime and uh, and we want uh, we want this condition to hold. So that guarantee that for this random graph, this probability one, we always have infinitely many components. I got this many components and I assign values of my xi's on every single component in an independent manner, and I got my collection of random variables xi's. They are all valued plus one minus one. Okay, so that's that's the our model here. I think uh, we are good on time. So any questions so far? What is the linear process? Uh, I'll show you, yeah, I'll show you, yeah. We'll go there. Um, so how, you do you how do you enumerate those components? Oh, it doesn't matter. that's a good question. Um, uh, it doesn't matter in the sense that you can represent, you can just, uh, you know, you can define the, you can, you can define their law in the, in the language of uh, finite dimensional distribution, so in that way you don't, you don't need to number them. You need to enumerate them, and but you may if you you may need that kind of notion to try to really sampling this kind of structure. I think that's a very hard question. They mentioned in the paper they mentioned that they can do simulation, but I think it's not uh, clearly explained. At least to me, there's still some work to do to do kind of a something. But just in terms of law, I think it just work with the finite dimensional distribution. You don't need a you don't need a, a, a number because you for a set, which means there's the first x one. Uh, yes, no, I mean, what I mean by, by finite dimension distribution is you look at, say, x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you, you ask the conditioning on how many components you have here, conditioning on who and who are in the same component, who and who are not in the same component, then you have your log explicitly. And then you have your, you know, I think so that's, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so now, before explaining our result, including what is the linear process, so one of the questions, one of the things that we, we, we thought of is, okay, in the standard uh, class situation, what we have is, like in the, first, in, the, in the first case, we look at the partial sum, and here we should look at the partial sum of this form. As n, n is the vector in the, in the Z2, is summation of i, uh, say, 0 less than equal to i, less than so we look at this partial sum, and we look at uh, when both n1 and n2, the minimum goes to infinite, what is my limiting object? That's, uh, actually, that's uh, in many cases that uh, we have seen the uh, limit theorems of this form. Okay, that's very natural. And if you draw a picture, what we have is, okay, as I can, this as n is a partial sum of, uh, of a big box, of a big rectangle. 
and uh, this is n1, and this is n2. And as long as both directions goes to infinite, I can have a invariant transform. So at least that is obvious if x i r i and it's pretty obvious. Okay, if you are you have some weak dependence, uh, there are many results like this. You always see uh, a Brownian sheet at the very end. But here, that is not uh, what we. Uh, that is not what we, we have here. Actually, this assumption is uh, is is, uh, is too weak. We need stronger assumption. So we do not need. Uh, we need something more than this. So what we need is the following. Um, I think I want to introduce some notation here. So these are my alpha eyes. So let me see where do I put them here on this board. Uh, let me put them here. So I write my E to be a diagonal matrix of 1 over alpha 1 and 1 over alpha 2. Okay? And I write my n to the power e to be n to the power 1 over alpha 1 and n to the power 1 over alpha 2. In other words, in this graph, what I want to see is I want to have n to the power 1 over alpha 1. Here, I want to have n to the power 1 over alpha 2. And my n is just a number an integer number. And then I let my n go to infinity. In this step, I, have, uh, I need to look at the speed of these two, uh, 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 two directions. They have some proportional speed. Okay? So actually, I can take, uh, I can take my matrix to be, doesn't have to be alpha alpha 2, but alpha 1 prime alpha 2 prime. Okay, you can take any, you give me any speed alpha 1 prime alpha 2 prime, and doesn't have to be the original one. And of course, you take the original one, you see something very special. But if you take some arbitrary one, you still can look at this kind of, kind of a window. And then you look at t1 in this direction and the t2 in that direction. If you look at the partial sum over this box, that's how to see a limiting object. So let me write this down. What I mean is, I look at s t prime in this by n of a vector t. This one is the sum of all the random variables. Um, so here I should have uh, n 1 over alpha 1 t 1 and n 1 over alpha 2 1 t 2 x r so It is clear what I mean by I'm summing a very specific rectangle with a very specific speed. Okay, so I want these two, uh, two edges have a very, very specific speed, and that's uh, that's encoded in this matrix E prime. Okay. So that's uh, so that's our model. I think now I'm going to talk about my uh, uh, our uh, our results. So this one is bad, I think. Uh, Following. So given this model, given this way of, given this way of, uh, you know, uh, take the partial sum over this, there's specific rectangles. What we could have is, I look at this. I'll uh, focus on the case that I take the very specific matrix E, which is uh, each coordinate, the speed is corresponding to the uh, original one. Is there a question there, Prasenna? No, no. I'm not sure it's alpha one dash or alpha one. It's, it's alpha one dash. Right? Uh, these are uh, prime. Yeah, prime. Okay. Yeah. So here I just take everything is uh, just like the original alpha one alpha two. Okay, I look at uh, the scale n. So this is a random. This is the part of sum over the, that specific uh, rectangles. I normalize by by n to the power one n to the power one plus the trace of the matrix E over two. That's my normalization. This one as a random field. This one has a limit. And the limit is the Gaussian process. And, uh, and I, if the Gaussian process clearly this is zero mean, so I only need to give you the covariance structure of this guy.
So this one uh, is equal to like this. We, there's an explicit constant, we know what is this constant, and uh, integral over r squared, 1 over, uh, I think I forgot to mention a critical condition there. Uh, so let me write this down. So I'll explain what is phi in a moment. Shows up when you when you kind of uh, do the uh, Fourier transform of the indicator function over a specific uh, rectangle, and uh, I'm not sure I'll have time to put the proof on that part. But uh, at least given this part, it's very easy to find the uh, harmonizable representation of this Gaussian field, which I'm not going to do it here. But um, let me just finish on explaining what is phi. So one key assumption on my measure mu I forgot to say is. Um, so either there are some kind of mu i, which are mu i are regularly varying with n to the power minus of i, and the mu is just a product of mu one, mu two. So I would have if my psi are i i d with the measure mu. So what do I have? I will have the summation. Well, this mu is a measure on r two. So those is psi i are random vectors. I look at the partial sum of the first coordinate of most my random vector. I normalize by n to power 1 over alpha 1. Okay. And uh, I look at the partial sum of the second coordinate of my uh, random vector. I normalize by n to power, n to power uh, 1 over alpha 2. This again is random vector. And this one should convert us to uh, uh, infinite divisible distribution in R2, which we call its, call its measure of uh, mu. Okay. And there are experts in this room on this kind of uh, multivariate, non standard regular variation. But for this simple case, you can do all the calculation by hand. And for this one, that phi is just uh, the Fourier transform of, uh, uh, sorry, the first function of this measure defined as E uh, I. You can do two, but you can do you can you can have obvious generalization for the for any d. Our results for any d here is here in this case. Well, I said say two here, right? So our result is that for all these, but that's not very uh, important. Okay, so that's our uh, main result here. So we have a product convergence in the space of d, and uh, we have a limiting object. And uh, let me give some remark here. So first of all, this limiting object clearly, well, it's uh, in this conference that definitely should talk about uh, uh, self-similarity. So what do we expect here? Well, we have the covariance function. So actually, we can go to many, many, many more information from the covariance function. So what we could have is, for example, the first thing we could have is we look at this image random field, I times t. And uh, if I want to scale the time to get kind of a similarity here, Clearly, because my normalization is not at the same speed in both directions, I want to normalize uh, in this way. So I stretch my temporal directions at each direction. I have a different uh, stretch. Okay, so one is def determined by alpha one, the other is determined by alpha two, actually one over. Okay, I do this stretching, and this one should involve, well, in the finite dimension distribution, should be involved equal to the same process we raise to uh, the power h. And this h, of course, is the h in this result. So that's just a, this is just a consequence. If you have a coherence function, you just uh, you got this one kind of all over three. Okay, that's one thing. And uh, the second thing is we can talk about uh, 
uh, increments. And we can talk about uh, past properties because all these results you can they can. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but at least uh, you, you, given the correct structure, you can get a lot of information on these kind of uh, results. I think our results on past properties are not as strong as possible. We still have some regularity result there. And for increment, you can say clearly you have some um, increments over uh, over rectangular state. Okay, so that's what is also kind of consequence uh, from this result. And there are some things that is are not that obvious. And uh, so when I first started to work on this question, my first reaction is, okay, so my first question to myself is, what will be the limiting momentum field? And uh, I was, I mean, naively thinking, okay, maybe that's the fractional front end sheets we will show up in the final, in the limit. Actually, uh, uh, we have only very few cases of the fractional front end sheets in the, in the limit. Most of the time, you do not see fractional front end sheets. It's, it's, it's a different structure. And that's, again, you can do a, actually, we did a very subtle analysis of the current structure. We have a if and only condition when you do see uh, a fractional front end sheets in the limit. Okay. And uh, the last one, actually, uh, four should have come before three. The last one is, we can do this not using this normal normalization, but using any normalization E prime. And if I'm taking a different speed of my rectangles, then clearly my uh, the rate of the, the, the order of the convergence should not be the same, but depending on both the original the original speed and uh, the speed I choose. And then of course, then the limiting of that should also depend on the original E and uh, this E prime that I choose. And I'm not going to give a the covariant function for this guy because that's a little bit complicated. But you look at this one, this one seems because, well, at least to us, it's a little bit, it's quite exciting because that means at different speeds, we always can have, actually most of the time, can have inverse principle leading to a limiting object of this type. Okay, it's always similar to similar type. But, um, uh, but they, they, this guy may, may, may vary. Okay, so that's something kind of a, a little bit uh, unexpected. And another highlight is not only we have this, okay, we can do kind of different uh, E prime there, but also uh, in terms of proof, actually we, we figure out a kind of a unified approach to treat all the possible cases kind of in one proof. That was not, um, well, it took us a while to, to get there. It was, uh, at the beginning, we just thought we just proved the case for. E prime equals E, and then E prime equals something very specific, and then we realize, okay, actually the proof can be can be generalized. So that's the uh, comment on this uh, on the result of uh, uh, on our result. So any question on this part? So I think uh, I still have time to talk about the one uh, one technique that we used here. Um, so let me. I mean, where's the comment here? So the idea of the proof uh, has two parts. I thought, uh, one part is um, and how we put? How do we put our hand to show this uh, limit theorem? And the answer actually is at least the first time you've heard it is quite easy. We use uh, we try to find a marginal structure in this uh, in this random field. Okay. So what we can do is we can write x i equals to the summation of some coefficients q j times x i stop uh, minus j stop. That is a more a small lemma that we showed. It's uh, I think it's not, let me explain. So QJ are coefficients. Actually, we know QJ equals to probability of uh, zero belongs to AJ. The idea is okay. Look at this graph. You start from vertex J. You draw one jump, another jump, another jump. Eventually, your jump goes to negative infinite, and you ask on oh, this line. 
whether zero is in this line or not. And that is the probability. And that is Q day. So, well, the baseline is Q day is something we actually know quite well. Okay, it's Q day we know. And this guy are stationary martingale differences. So here I write this statement down, and then you should uh, actually immediately get some questions because normally we talk about stationary, we talk about martingale in the one dimensional setup. And here we are in the multi dimension, actually any arbitrary dimension larger than one. And what do I mean by that? And that is one uh, technical point I think I want to elaborate here before I stop. So basically, when you talk about the martingale, you need to talk about the filtration. And I think it's well known that several people here in this audience are, have done work on this part. I think that's. Uh, uh, at the first, at the very beginning, it's related to the uh, multiple stochastic integrals. Um, you need to think of okay, in, in, in two dimensions, say in two dimension, even I have a random variable x k here, I want to talk about the notion of conditional uh, expectation. So, what filtration or what sigma algebra do I take? Okay, that's the question if you want to talk about this molecular difference vector. And uh, one. Uh, one uh, one uh, one point is you take okay everything in this shaded area. Okay, you take sigma algebra of all the um, x l for l um, in uh, in this white area. Okay, and that's your that's your path. We want to make draw parallel to the one-dimensional case, and I call this guy f of uh, f of uh, this is j, so f of j, okay, and then you shift this by one. That's your that's your solution. Okay. If you were reason one, but there are also other options, and uh, this one is very powerful because all basically all the martingale techniques will go through. If you have this kind of uh, filtration, you can do conditional argument, then uh, basically the same technique can be applied to high dimension. But on the other hand, this one is very restrictive. It's not very obvious how you find interesting models having this kind of a filtration structure. Another possible try is, okay, you look at this lower left corner, which I marked in red. You can talk about this, uh, this kind of a filtration, h of j, which is the sigma algebra generated by all random variables belonging to uh, this region. That's another sigma algebra you can consider. This one. You have more examples to consider. Uh, at the same time, this one, uh, it's uh, technically many techniques just fail. To work with this one, it actually is much harder than the previous one. And actually, the, the, the right way to do things here is actually another very convenient one in principle is you can say, actually, I don't care what the martingale structure you take. I know one dimensional martingale CLT very well, and I just want to take a one dimensional martingale here. And then, uh, well, I have a space of Z2, which is not, uh, it's only, ha does not have a very natural order in Z2, but doesn't matter, I just pick an order. I can pick the lexicographic order in Z2. So that's my filtration called this G. That is, I take the, all the random variables in this blue region. And that is, that is the shape of the sigma algebras when you have when you work with the lexical graphic order for D2. Okay, you work with this one, um, you take a look actually, this one, you can just apply the one-dimensional Martingale CLT and to solve the problem. So we have these three uh, sigma algebras, and uh, the last thing I want to talk about here is actually in this case, uh, for this representation, for this guy, for our Martingale difference. Actually, here in this picture for this xj, uh, all the three uh, sigma algebras I choose here, uh, they are they are the same thing here. But they're the same thing. I'm saying if I want to look at uh, if I want to look at uh, the conditional mean of any function f of xj, even the white guy. It's the same of the conditional notation of this f of x j, even uh, the red guy. So that means that this actual this actual information in this blue area, this white area, 
they do not affect at all this XJ given the red area. And uh, there's a very simple explanation of that. So why that is the case? Because if I, well, you look at this structure, the dependent structure depending on how you go the address. Suppose you know all the information of this, this red area, you want to know what is the law of XJ. So what you do, what you do is just draw one uh, random edge, and this edge will necessarily jump into somewhere in this red region. That means all the values you know in this blue region and the white region, and this guy will never touch, and they are positionally independent. So that means this all the three uh, sigma algebras, in terms of the, the calculations of the application of this Margill CLT, they're the same. You just pick the one that you work the most convenient with, and that's the right one. Okay, and for that one, you can go from there, apply the standard of uh, Margill CLT, and that's essentially one of the that's one of the two uh, the big part of this uh, of this result. So that's the first part of the proof is kind of a. Remark CLT, and the second part is just, uh, I don't have time, just uh, once you have the CLT, uh, once you have uh, actually this structure, this guy are marking you differences, they are uncorrelated. Once you have this guy, what you gotta do is, okay, you want to have the CLT, you want to prove the match principle, you can do the covariance. And then the calculation of covariance is just a calculation of the Q days, which we know actually pretty well. But I say pretty well, it still takes a lot of work to get to this formula because, as I mentioned, this formula depends on both E and E prime, and it's essentially there are a lot of uh, calculation to, to carry out. But uh, the, the point is, okay, in this presentation, you don't have to bother about this molecule difference. Just to work out the coefficients, which makes the problem uh, kind of actually uh, much easier to attack. So I think I'm running a lot of time and space, and I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Jacques, for the nice talk. Oh, I've got a question. Uh, can you introduce dependence between mu1 and mu2? Say it again? Can you introduce dependence in mu1 and mu2? That's a great question. I don't have time to talk about That's a great question. Uh, I think the Kinevan is great. So basically, if you have, uh, let's the measure mu here, if you have this no standard multi, say, multivariate regular variation, okay? No matter what's your spectral matter, doesn't matter. As long as you have convergence, you figure out what is your E. You want your E to be a diagonal matrix. And that's actually not, that's nothing to do with your spectral matter. As long as your E is diagonal, ma is a diagonal matrix, then you can carry out the same thing. And your spectral dependence matter will show out in this part of the covariance structure. So we do have all that. So that's not, uh, that's something actually, after we done the calculation of the product one, that's something we realized, okay, actually everything goes through. So. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Dr.